Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today. We will be getting started here in just a couple of minutes uh, for some entertainment. We've got a little video for you about PAC. So it's just about a minute long if you wanna watch this. We'll probably play it once or twice here while people still come into the classroom, uh, but enjoy. As a professional pet care provider, you assume you are good at what you do. But how can you prove to prospective clients that you have the training and skills to provide exceptional care for their pets? The Professional Animal Care Certification Council is here to change that. Independent certification is becoming essential in the pet care industry, and PAC is the not-for-profit organization that offers three different levels of certification. Whether you're a provider who spends most of your time hands-on with the pets, a manager, or an operator, there's an exam specially designed for you. PAC certification is how you can set yourself apart as a credible professional in the world of pet care. Validate your knowledge and expertise with certification today. The Professional Animal Care Certification Council. It's safer in a PAC. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're having lots of people pop in here. We're super excited to have you uh, today. Just a couple of minutes and we'll get things rolling here. I think we'll play this video about PAC one more time while we wait here in the last minute or two. This is just a little summary about PAC and who we are and what we do and why it's important to you and pet parents. As a professional pet care provider, you assume you are good at what you do. But how can you prove to prospective clients that you have the training and skills to provide exceptional care for their pets? The Professional Animal Care Certification Council is here to change that. Independent certification is becoming essential in the pet care industry, and PAC is the not-for-profit organization that offers three different levels of certification. Whether you're a provider who spends most of your time hands-on with the pets, a manager, or an operator, there's an exam specially designed for you. PAC certification is how you can set yourself apart as a credible professional in the world of pet care. Validate your knowledge and expertise with certification today. The Professional Animal Care Certification Council. It's safer in a path. Okay, I think we will go ahead and get started here. We're just about to 11 o'clock Eastern time. So we'll, we wanna start right on time today. We've got lots of great content. My name is Jess Zelmer. I am one of the board members for PAC, um, our Professional Animal Care Certification Council. And we are so glad to have you today and so glad to have Robin and Susan of the Dog Goobers today presenting some great content. Um, I know that today is, uh, and this time is a, a very interesting time, maybe a very stressful time for many of us. So I invite you just to sit down, relax a little bit, learn a little bit, uh, take a little break from everything that's going on in your daily life and do something to uh, make you, your business, or your career uh, a little bit better. So what we're going to do today before the main event of Robin and Susan with the Dog Gurus is that we just want to tell you a little bit about PAC. I'm going to take three or four minutes today um, to tell you a little bit about the Professional Animal Care Certification Council. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is consider yourself super lucky it looks like we've already exceeded our maximum attendees for the live conference today, which is the very first time we've we've done that. So thank you, Robin and Susan, to uh, for being such a great draw and bringing some great awareness to PAC. Uh, fortunately, everybody else will get to see the recording, but uh, good thing you grabbed your seat early here because we are we are at maximum capacity already. So let's learn a little bit about PAC. What is PAC? 
Uh, PAC is a third party certification for the pet care industry. Uh, we uh, believe it is extremely important to our pet care, uh, the, the industry that we know and love so much, to bring it to a higher level. And the way that we can do that is what most professions actually do is have an independent certification to verify uh, people's knowledge who get into this industry. Right now, the pet care industry you know, let's be honest, it's a fairly easy industry to enter. Uh, in many cases, there's, there's very little oversight, uh, very little regulations. And even though that has a lot of benefits to us in terms of, in terms of our businesses, it also makes it very easy to enter uh, for people who might not have the right intentions. And all of those uh, things that everything that happens in the pet care industry reflects on each of us and, and each of our pet care businesses. So what PAC's mission is to really elevate our industry and quite frankly, to make it a safer place for pets and a safer place for people to work. We get a lot of questions about this. So I've changed up these slides a little bit because this is probably the, the question we get asked the most. What is the difference between a third party certification and other certificate programs that are out there in the pet care industry? And the difference is very important. Um, PAC is the only third party certification in the pet care industry. And what is the difference between a third party certification and a certificate program? There are quite a few, and I've listed them here, highlighted the ones that um, I think are most important. And let me begin by saying certificate programs are excellent. Uh, anytime you can expand your knowledge, uh, make you a better pet care provider, learn something uh, that expands your skill set is an excellent thing. So certificate programs are excellent and they are great for our industry and great for you and your businesses, but they are not the same as third party certifications. Um, some of the main differences are that third party certification, you have to have some amount of professional experience. Uh, you can't just take a study and take a test and, and print yourself out a certificate, which you can with many certificate programs. It requires you, PAP requires you to be in the field a certain amount of hours for each level to sit for the exam and take the exam. It's awarded by a third party. So PAC has no financial interest uh, in any of the content materials, that you use to study. Um, it is a nonprofit organization, which is not the case for most certificate programs. Uh, so we are not gaining anything financially by you taking the exam. Uh, it's really there to test your knowledge. Another big difference is that third party certification requires ongoing um, education. You don't just uh, study, take the test, and that's it. You get the certificate, you hang it on the wall for the next 10 years, and you're good to go. Uh, every three years, just like uh, many professions, you will uh, have to complete um, continuing education units uh, in order to be able to maintain that certification. We want to make sure that knowledge continues uh, throughout the years. Why is PAC important to your business? Our industry needs this, it, and it needs it bad. We want to um, make pet care professional, elevate the industry, and bring it to the next level. The pet care industry is an increasingly competitive market. This is something that will really make you stand out when you market it well to your community. It will make you stand out as a leader in pet care in your individual communities. You'll have confidence in your employee's knowledge. If you are an employee, um, you will have confidence um, that you are doing what you can to advance your career. Um, it's a documented commitment to safety. And if you're a business owner, uh, hiring somebody with PAC certification, it's going to get you some really high quality employees and those that are dedicated. Our next exams are in June and November. Uh, we we kind of got wiped out here by coronavirus with our last testing dates um, falling right when the crisis uh, began, but our next dates are going to be in June. If you don't know, there's a, a study group for each level of the exam. Just go to Facebook. 
um, for provider level, manager level, operator level, whichever one is most appropriate for you, you can join uh, a Facebook group and it will help you study for the exams. Okay, so I went one minute over my allotted time here, but let's uh, get to the main event. Uh, I don't think these two really need any introduction. Robin Bennett and Susan Briggs uh, the, with the Dog Gurus, uh, excellent advocates of our industry, and we are really um, uh, pleased and, and just so excited to have them here today to present you with some great material. Um, now the moment of truth, Robin. I'm going to pass the um, presenting rights over to you. I see that you're unmuted, which is good. All right, okay. I, think, I think I have control. Yeah, we're seeing your screen. So here we go. You can talk to your sold out audience here. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, and we will go ahead and get started. All right, thanks everybody for being here. We really appreciate the opportunity that PAC's providing to come to you today and I'm Robin Bennett and Susan are you still there hopefully I am is. here hello everyone that's all that's awesome when we're all both online at the same time from different locations so we're just really happy you guys are here um, we want to talk about avoiding pet pet tragedies and pet yeah. care and I feel like we planned this topic long before COVID-19 hit uh, but I think it's actually really pertinent because I know a lot of people are kind of taking a break. They don't have a lot of dogs. A lot of you are working with your staff to try to retrain them or get them trained. But I think we're going to, before we know it, we're going to be open again and have dogs again. And I just feel like we need to make sure that we're taking the precautions to do all the right things so we don't kind of forget the importance of everything and the the, the problems that can arise. Actually, just this week, I already received a, an email from someone who had an incident in their daycare. Just They just had gotten a little slack and just need to you know, refresh things. So that's what we're gonna try to do today. There is a handout that is you hopefully received via email, but it's also in the handout section on your little control. So that just helps you to follow along and take some notes and hopefully you know, get some action items for you to take after this is over. So a couple of things we wanna start with, just to make sure you're in the right place, is if you really wanna ensure you wanna avoid injuries or deaths in your pet care center, obviously that's what we all want. And hopefully those of you that are on this call are really wanting to be proactive about that. If that's the case, you're definitely in the right place. Um, maybe you're scared a dog will escape and you wanna prevent it from happening. Like, What are the things that keep you up at night? I know with my facility, a dog getting hurt kept me up at night. So just making sure that you really understand how you can prevent that and how your staff can help to prevent that. Or maybe you've had a tragedy and you just never want to go through that again. Unfortunately, it does happen. We want to minimize that. And if you've had that unfortunate situation, you know more than anybody that you just don't want to go through that again. So if any of those apply, then you're definitely in the right place. And I think you're going to hopefully get a lot out of this presentation. And Susan and I definitely believe in positive reinforcement. So we want to reward those who are here and who showed up and grabbed their seat early. And we will tell you if you stick around, we're going to let you know how you can get a couple of freebies from us. So we're going to give out the four E's of excellence in operation, operating a daycare facility. Those are the operational standards for your daycare. And then also a roll call form. And as you go through this presentation, you're going to see why that form is going to be so critical to what you're doing. So just jumping in, some of the tragedies that Susan and I hear about, I mean, I don't think a month goes by where we don't hear about something happening in a daycare environment. And the problem is that it could be daycare, it could be lodging, it could be grooming, like tragedies just shouldn't happen. That's just, I, we get really, Susan and I both get really upset when we hear sort of this complacent, well, you know, you have, animals in there it's bound to happen i don't think that should be the attitude and some of the tragedies that we've seen you know dogs that die of heat stroke or maybe one of them that we heard about that actually happened twice was a dog that died of heat stroke because it, a pool fell on top of them one of those little kitty pools like literally the first time that happened susan and i were horrified obviously as everybody else that heard about that tragedy but then about a year later it happened again in another facility 
And so that's where we're really saying we need to learn from each other. And what might be a fluke, a fluke accident, if it happens again, that's just really, really bad for the whole industry, obviously. So things like that, we just need to learn from our mistakes and learn from others' mistakes and improve our own protocols. Um, dogs that escape from outdoor fences and hopefully they get found before anything happen happens to them. But we have known of situations where the dog has then gotten hit by a car. Again, something that is pretty not, I won't say necessarily easy to avoid, but if you take the steps, it does become much more preventable. Or dogs that are attacked and killed by two aggressive dogs in a boarding facility. That is another, these things have all happened, the things that you're seeing on the screen. And that was just because dogs were accidentally put together and one, two of the dogs were deemed aggressive in advance and they were supposed to never be put with other dogs. But protocols weren't in place and it did happen. So these are the things we really, really, really want to prevent. These are the things that hopefully keep you up at night and we're going to help you sleep a little better by giving you some protocols that will help you. What we're going to cover in our session today is to give you some tips on how to manage to prevent escapes. Um, and it does just take putting in some good safety protocols and SOPs. And right now, that's something we've been sharing with our membership is a great time to go back through your SOPs and get them firmed up. So we're going to give you some tips on that today. We're also going to um, give you some tips on how to recognize and prevent heat stress in dogs because um, the hot weather is coming. We don't know how many dogs we're going to have in our care, but it really doesn't matter because it's you have to understand and be able to identify when a dog is overheating. So we're going to talk about that today. And we're also going to talk about how you can prevent dog fights. Um, this is kind of where Robin and I got started in this industry as far as sharing education information. And so it's kind of sad how long we've been teaching this, but um, it's one of our favorite or most popular presentations on is preventing dog fights and, and bites. So we're going to um, go over that as well. So first of all, I kind of talked about it earlier. It really does come down to having sound policies and procedures that are going to prevent accidents from happening. I truly believe that most of these tragedies with the right SOPs and the right training and holding staff accountable and yourself accountable, they could be prevented, which is why Robin and I get on our little soapboxes about some of these things is they're not necessarily tragic accidents. I think they could have been prevented. So we're really glad to be here today to kind of share some tips because we don't like to read about these stories and we definitely don't like to hear about them in um, places with um, members and people we know. So for those of you who have not met Robin and I, we have been working together in the pet industry for a long time. In 2007, we wrote um, that red book there, Off Leash Dog Play, A Complete Guide to Safety and Fun to help teach people that are operating playgroups and dog daycares how to read canine body language and manage the dogs to keep them safe. That was really what our passion was to get started. So we started with our book and then we took that book and created um, Knowing Dogs um, because we know teaching body language and play, it helps to have video. So the Knowing Dogs program has video and ship tips to help apply the knowledge learned to your pet center. And Robin and I um, are not just consultants who did this. Both of us owned and operated pet care centers prior to writing the book together. Robin operated a daycare and was um, the most biggest and most popular pet dog training facility in Virginia when she lived there. Um, she was one of the very early pioneers in dog daycare. And then I operated in Houston, Texas, um, and was again, one of the first daycares to open in Houston. And we recognized early on when employment was very high that you could train people to learn how to read body language and safely manage the dog. So we have been in your shoes. We have both sold our centers and since the dog gurus reform back in um, 2013 we've really been focused on 
providing tools and resources to keep the dog safe, keep them happy, and to help you um, manage them more easily. So we're going to look at each of the things we talked about earlier, and we're going to look at kind of three things about each tragedy. One is how it happens. Second is tools to prevent it. And the third is going to be policies and procedures to help prevent it. And as we go along, if you have questions, you're welcome to type those questions in the chat area. And Jess is going to be monitoring those. So we'll hopefully try to answer any questions either during the uh, during the session or right at the end, we'll try to save some time. So we're happy to answer any questions, but let's dive in with looking at escape. So how it happens, tools to prevent it and policies and procedures to prevent it from happening in the future. First of all, how it happens. I mean, it's kind of makes sense that in a, inadequate fencing is one of the first ways that this can happen. Gates not latched, obviously not recognizing jumpers which i'm going to talk about jumping dogs that are jumpers have very specific behaviors that they do that if you don't teach your staff those behaviors you're going to end up with maybe problems with jumping but there's some easy ways you can identify a dog that goes out into the yard and he's saying okay i'm looking for a way out um obviously not supervising the dogs well enough so susan and i if you've heard us ever talk you probably have heard us say if, you're, if any dogs are together anywhere, somebody should be with them physically. So looking at that, just not being there, and then next thing you know, a dog is gone. So dogs can jump over fences or climb over fences amazingly fast. So that's a, big, a huge issue if you're not out there physically with them. And we don't count cameras or looking through a window or that kind of thing. We're talking about physically being with the dogs. Lack of dog handler training, which is just really the, the handlers who are out there with the dogs don't know what they're even looking at. And again, there's some precursory behaviors that dogs will do before they try to get out. And then lack of roll calls, which we're going to talk about. But the interesting thing is that even if you have all these measures in place, things can still happen. So it goes back to making sure your policies match. So I'll tell you one of the things that happened in my facility. And at this point I was in, this was in my second facility, I was in a shopping center and we had an outdoor area that was connected to a door that went into my facility. And then if you open that door, it went into the back area of the parking lot of the shopping center where we had a fenced in play yard. And we got into the, and that, that play yard was fenced in completely with an eight foot fence. There was a gate on the back fence because the fire marshal requires a gate for uh, egress in case of a fire. So we had a gate back there and we never used that gate. So the fire marshal said we could not put a lock on that gate because it's against fire regulations. And as soon as the fire marshal came and approved our center, we immediately put a lock on that gate because, <laughs> with a key next to it so that I wanted to be able to unlock it in case of a fire, but I also wanted it locked because I didn't want dogs to be able to get out of it. So I thought I was all taken care of with the whole <laughs> safety measures. So we got into the habit of walking out the door, opening the door, walking up to the door, opening the door, letting all the dogs run out, and then the staff member would walk out behind them because they were just going into a fenced in yard. Well, I did that one day. I opened the door. I let about 15 dogs go out. I walked out behind them and realized overnight someone had jammed the gate open. So the gate was actually open. So when I walked out into the play yard, 15 dogs were not in the fence. They all ran out of the fence. And I laugh now, I was not laughing the day it happened. They ran down basically in the back of the shopping center where semis drive to do their drop-offs and they have a big area where they can do a big turn. That's where all the dogs were. So again, like I thought I followed all the procedures I could, but I did not have a policy of you go out and check the yard first, which we obviously ended up changing that. So some tools to prevent some of this, again, Oh, I will tell you in case you're wondering what happened. I went out there. None of the dogs were hurt. They all came back. So I went out there. I immediately yelled for one of my other staff members. She came out. We basically had, we had always practiced recalls with our dogs. So we had gotten into the habit of calling them. We did our recall game. So we went out there, call, started calling dogs, and we basically acted like crazy lunatics. Like, whoa! like acting really crazy, they all, all 15 of them ran right back and ran into the yard and we shut the gate. 
So they came back pretty quick, but that could have been a horrendous tragedy. So a couple of things was one, we had been practicing recalls and two, you know, they were, we all took that action really quick to call them back. And thankfully they all came back. So it turned out to not be a tragedy, but it could have totally been a tragedy. So some tools to prevent this kind of escape. Um, one, one of them that we would always recommend is a minimum height of at least six feet. Eight feet is better. And if you really do think you're going to have dogs where it's a dangerous situation and you like if you're really close to a, a road or something like that, then you might even consider fencing that is in that um, canters in at the top, which helps to prevent dogs from jumping it. One of the areas we see a big problem at times is gaps at the bottom of the fencing. So my fence was on cement. So we actually drilled rebar into the ground so that the dogs couldn't push against the bottom of the fence to push it open. And dogs are really creative at trying to figure out how to get out. So again, that's another thing to teach your staff to watch for is are they actually trying to push at the fence at the bottom and making sure that if you don't have a way to securely embed the fence into the dirt, which is what we would normally recommend, bury some of it. Like for me, I couldn't do that because it was on asphalt. So I had other ways to prevent the fence from being pushed open, or you could put material at the bottom. Identifying jumpers, again, jumpers, when they go out to a yard, what will typically happen is if they are really looking for a way out, they'll they'll go to the, to the fence and immediately start walking the perimeter of the fence, usually looking up, which is not normal behavior for a dog unless they're a jumper. So if you see a dog that goes out into your yard and they start walking the fence line and they start looking up and it just looks like they're casually walking along the fence. But if you think about it, that's really not normal for them to walk the fence line like that. So that's a dog that's at least in the back of his head considering maybe I should have a way to get out of here and they're looking for a way. Locks on fencing, which as I said, you know, make sure you have a lock on your fence. You probably should have a key next to that because there are fire hazards if you can't get out of that fenced in yard. Um, and then dog identification tools. If the dogs do get out, do you have a way of recognizing them or is there something on them that has the name of the business or how to call you or whatever? And then staff training is gonna be huge. So the staff training, and you're gonna see throughout this seminar that staff training and your policies and procedures, like Susan said, are just really critical to preventing some of these. So you should have some kind of minimum requirement before your handlers are ever with the dogs. What are what do they actually have to know? So for escaping and jumping, they should know that there should be some policy in place to make sure that you're checking that area. That was the mistake I made at my facility. I didn't have that policy. I didn't have a policy that said every morning someone should go out in the backyard and actually make sure the fence is closed or the gate is closed. Cause I never really thought that that could happen cause there was a lock on the gate. But what had happened was someone just jammed it open and the lock, the lock was still on the gate, but the gate was open. So making sure you're looking for any kind of places where maybe a dog has dug out. Or if you have big dogs like me, I have larger dogs. So mostly I've had labs and shepherds and quiche hounds. Well, I had a dog, one of my friends brought her dog over one time to stay at my house for like half a day while she went to the store and her dog got out of my fence. This was in my backyard in Virginia. But there was one tiny spot in my fence that I knew was there, but I never thought about it because it was too small. It was too small for my dog to get out. So I never really thought about it. Well, I brought her dog over and I was the first thing it found was the little hole in the fence where it could just skimmy under the fence. Again, luckily he came back, but those are the things that you just don't think about. So your staff needs to know some kind of pro policy or protocol for checking the area before letting the dogs out, you know, making sure that if you do have jumpers, I would not even let them out. Like if I know a dog is trying to get out, then that dog gets marked as this dog only goes out on leash because I don't want to take the risk. And then hourly roll call. So this is the biggest thing for me is that we've had, we have heard of situations where a dog has escaped and the staff didn't even know the dog was gone until the owner came to pick it up. That should never happen, ever. That is one thing that I will get on my soapbox about forever. You have to have a policy of doing an at least hourly roll call when um, you have dogs in your center that are playing off leash somewhere. So that staff who's managing those dogs should have a list of dogs and every hour they should just run through that list. Okay, do I have all 10 of these dogs here? Great and physically count them. Ideally, physically put your hands on them too to make sure that they're okay. 
but you also should do that out that roll call roll call anytime you move dogs from one room to the other whether you're inside or outside if you're just moving them from the lodging area to the play area when you get outside do the roll call if you move them from the play area outside to a play yard inside do a roll call that should just be common practice that should be happening all the time for every um, staff member that you have that is in charge of some of the dogs all right now we're going to talk about heat stress and this is something you know being um, in Texas that is important for all of our dogs and it one thing that I want to share is it doesn't just happen outside um, we were an all indoor facility and we had a dog heat stress in our grooming area when the AC was on and running and operating um, what had happened it was a, a dog that was a little overweight and the humidity had gotten too high and so thank goodness our um, groom team recognized the dog was in distress and we were able to get it to the veterinarian and get it treated so it was a big lesson i i feel like rob and i had a lot of these experiences when we were in our centers because we can now share them and hopefully as robin said all along what we need to do in our industry is yeah it's an accident a, a dog heat stressing in our groom area but I can share that with you and so that you can make sure that your um, everyone in your business knows the signs and symptoms of heat stress and can take precautions because actually we had heard of uh, the same facility in a period of about a year had two dogs die of heat distress I think that is no longer an accident that is not learning from what has happened and recognizing and putting um, protocols in place. So um, with heat stress, what you want to do um, is definitely know your breeds because there are some breeds that are more susceptible. Um, the brachiophilic, so your bulldogs, um, French and English, um, pugs, they just do not have the respiratory systems and so they are going to be at higher risk of um, heat distress first. Also, overweight, overweight dogs, um, dogs that may have um, pre-existing conditions, maybe senior dogs. So make sure you're aware of dogs that are higher at risk and that you monitor all dogs, but those dogs you monitor extra close. So um, knowing your breeds is important. The other thing is to actually have um, temperature controls in place which means you have thermometers and guides on what are safe temperatures um, if you don't have those you're going to be at higher risk because your team doesn't know um, how to to manage and when it is becoming risk and then the other thing is making sure you understand that it's not just heat it's also humidity so again in Houston that's something we're very much aware of that um, as the humidity goes up it is harder to breathe the air is just heavier and so we need to be more alert to our pets because it definitely can impact them and then just like robin said preventing escapes we're going to use roll calls as one of our tools to um, keep the pets safe during high heat times as well so the tools that you're going to use is to have temperature gauges and this should be outside and inside um, having good airflow is really important especially inside you do need climate control at the level of the pet and that's again um, kind of fortunate heat rises but we need to know not only the real temperature but the feel like temperature and then we rec we recommend really having a chart that says once the temperature and humidity combination gets to this level dogs are outside in shorter time periods and maybe the brachiocephalic dogs only go out and potty and come right back in they may have no time out and it's okay to do um things differently for different dogs and then <clears throat> some things you can do outside that does help misting sprays help usually in lower humidity they they help keep dogs cooler and people this is also heat stress can happen to you as a person and your team members so you need to work with them to also recognize and know that they're staying cool um, having splash pads helps everybody cool off that water 
the pools um, and just the shade covers and using the shade and encouraging the dogs to get into the shade. I mean, I have a black dog um, and he will go out and lay in the sun and I think he needs his vitamin D, but I am always cautious of how long is he out in the, in the sun and I'll, I'll call him back into the shade if I feel like he's been laying out there too long when it's really hot. So then going now to your policies, um, it is doing the training of your team to make sure they understand breed characteristics in at-risk dogs and also having that first aid training to know not only the signs of heat stress, but how you respond to it if you do recognize it. And at the very beginning stages, you can do first aid, but if it gets much beyond that, it is going to require um, veterinary care. So we definitely recognize that you have a policy and a chart that based on temperature and humidity, what is the safe length of time for dogs to be outside um, and thinking about the different activity levels. With the really active, I would only do that in very early morning or late afternoon, not midday in the, in the heat of the summer, especially in the south. And so you need to have timers and make sure you're in compliance with that. And there needs to be someone who's responsible each day for knowing what the temperature is and making sure everyone that's on the team knows what protocols you're following as far as time outside the building that's safe. And then again, doing those hourly roll calls. And what we recommend during extreme heat times is that roll call, that recall back to you, also includes a quick little physical check so that you can see because some of the symptoms of heat stress or dogs are not responsive, um, they're panting, you can the gums and tongue will get more red. And so know those symptoms and part of the roll call process now for heat distress is to actually call and look at each dog and check on them to make sure they're not overheating. If you feel like they are, then they need to get inside and get cooled off. And so you're really checking for that responsiveness. Now you also want to make sure everybody is still there. Um, so that's the other reason to do roll calls because when dogs start to not feel good, they're going to try to go off by themselves potentially and separate. And so hopefully those of you that always say, my staff, they don't really have anything to do out there with the dogs. Hopefully you're starting to see where they shouldn't just be watching the dog. That's obviously a critical part of their job, as you've heard Susan and I have talked a lot about what staff members should be doing with dogs, but they should also be doing those roll calls and doing those checks and doing, is the dog responsive? So there's a lot that goes into, quote unquote, just watching the dogs, which is kind of what I think a lot of staff feel like that's their main job, but there's a lot going into that. So hopefully that gives you some ideas. So the next one we're going to talk about is dog fights. and I would love if there was never ever a dog fight ever because I really do feel like dog fights are what I think most people feel is the highest risk, but I also feel like dog fights are the easiest to prevent with proper staff training and with proper evaluation. So if your staff understands what they're doing and how to manage dogs off leash and if your facility does a really good job of screening the right dogs, so the only the right dogs are in your facility off leash, you're going to eliminate 99.9% .9 of every dog fight that could happen. So this one is, I guess these are all soapbox issues for me and Susan, but this one is really a soapbox issue for us because when we read articles or we get sent articles or we have lawyers call us about being expert witnesses, the attitude is always, well, that's just, you know, expected to happen, like I said before. And that's one of the things that, you know, will get me and Susan going more than anything, because we really don't think fights should be accepted risk. We should be doing a good job of training the staff and evaluating the dogs so we don't have it happen in the first place. So again, how this ends up happening a lot of times is you don't have any kind of acceptance or evaluation process which means dogs come in and you haven't really given a thought to what type of dogs do we really want in our center. Like it sounds like it, we would just think, well, of course we want dogs that are gonna play, but you have to really list that out. What specific behaviors do you wanna see? Not necessarily based on breed or age or any of that. Some of that might come into play, but we really say have a policy that says, here's the kind of behaviors we wanna see in our group. And if we're not seeing those behaviors, then that dog's not a good fit. 
And that's what you really have to spell out and have written and understand. And then you have to have a process where you are evaluating all of that. A lot of the control measures, just in terms of dogs in a group, how are you managing them? How is the, tra the staff interacting with them? If you don't have any measures in place, then you're more likely to have incidents. And what I mean by that is for those of you that have worked with Susan and I or talked to us or heard us talk, we do a lot of things like obedience behaviors. So we're big advocates of working with recalls and practicing recalls and practicing group sits and practicing gate boundaries. And all of those help you to manage the group and help the dogs see the handler as the person who's actually in charge. And if you're able to manage the dogs that way, you're not gonna have as many fights because the dogs are looking to you as a leader. And you're also gonna be able to recognize the, the dogs that maybe aren't fitting well in your group because they aren't responding well. And that is one of the reasons that we would say maybe dogs aren't suitable in a group is if they totally disregard the human handlers that are in there. Maybe they need additional training before they come to play group. So looking at that, and then a lot of just staff training, it's so common for people to just bring in a new employee, they get a little bit of time on the floor with somebody that's been there for a while, and then you're like, well, you know, you're good, watch these dogs, they're all good. I can tell you that was how I trained initially, so I know it happened, so, because I did it. This was one of the reasons Susan and I wrote Off Leash Dog Play was for our own staff. Like, that was the whole reason we initially set out to write that book together, because we knew it would help our own staff. And I had a situation that I've talked about before where the first time I hired somebody, my very first employee, after I'd been working in my daycare for a year by myself, I had a group of, of a dogs that were always really good together. And I told my new staff member, Jessie, to watch those dogs. So she came in, I was like, these dogs are really good, I'm going to lunch. And I just thought it would be, these dogs were easy dogs, that's what I thought. I came back and there was an incident that had happened where a dog got hurt because another dog jumped up and bit that dog's tail. And when I look back on it, I didn't teach Jesse anything. I assumed that those dogs were good. It turns out those dogs were good because of a whole bunch of stuff I was doing. That's the stuff we have to teach this, uh, the rest of the staff. So for those of you that you have those employees that are just good with dogs and you're like, they're just so good. The dogs never do anything when so-and-so's back there. All the stuff that person's doing, you need to teach your other staff. And the good thing is it is something you can teach, but you do have to set aside a process to teach those things. And they're little things just in terms of how you move with the dogs and how you um, interact with the dogs and how you pet the dogs and what you're asking the dogs to do. They're, they're small things, but they're all teachable. So making sure that you're able to get that staff training in. No training on predatory drift or mixing dogs of different sizes. Those kind of go hand in hand. Predatory drift is a situation where a dog can actually go after and attack another dog instinctually and it's different from just prey drive so predatory drift is really an unconscious behavior and the best way to explain it is if you think about how a wolf behaves when it sees um, something it wants to eat the wolf will you know see it stalk it chase it eventually catch it hopefully if it's successful and then shake it usually in some format to kill it and then eat it well dogs have that sequence in them but we as humans have bred dogs to have stronger parts of those sequence based on breed in other words terriers really really bred for that whole shaking sequence <laughs> they love to shake things and destroy things and you know kind of rip things up we've bred herding breeds to do the chase to do the stalking and chasing part but ideally not go farther than that we've we've bred certain breeds to have sequences of that whole chain that a wolf has well the what's possible to happen is that things can trigger the dog to actually play out the whole sequence typically the things that trigger it are a fast moving dog running usually a small dog so this is why you know squirrels and things dogs like to chase them because it does kind of trigger that sequence and then dogs that have that high pitched squeaking like if a dog got hurt and you know they do that high pitched like ar, ar, yelping kind of thing that can trigger it to happen too it's not going to happen every time and what should freak you out the most is you can't tell when it's going to happen but this is why that we recommend mixing dogs of different sizes because we just want to prevent predatory drift from occurring it can occur with a big dog to a big dog 
it's just less likely to cause a death. When it happens, big dog to little dog, a little dog runs, a big dog chases it and ends up grabbing it and shaking it, that can, all, that can result in a death immediately. And normally it's a death caused by internal injuries from the shaking. But the thing is that most people would say, well then just screen for predatory drift or screen for aggression. You can't really screen for predatory drift and you can screen for aggression, but predatory drift is not aggressive behavior. It's a food seeking behavior. Like if you think about a wolf who's chasing its antelope or whatever, you're not going, oh, the wolf's aggressive. You're saying the wolf is hungry. So that's why you can't, you can, you can definitely screen out aggressive dogs. I definitely don't want aggressive dogs in the daycare, but that doesn't mean you won't have a perfectly sweet dog that goes into predatory drift. So you do need to understand that. And it's just a risk if you mix dogs of different sizes. So tools to prevent this, um, design layout of your facility. So if you're taking dogs, like the example we talked about in the very beginning, if you're taking dogs that don't do well with other dogs and you're taking dogs that are gonna be in daycare, you have got to design your facility in a way that prevents those dogs from ever getting mixed. And you have to have some tracking measures, you have to have some signs or collars or whatever some way to absolutely prevent a dog from being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's what happened in that first example that we gave you was two dogs that had been classified as aggressive. They knew the dogs were aggressive and should never be with other dogs were in a room together playing. And then someone brought a daycare dog and put it in that same room. So maybe they need to make sure you actually go into the room, make sure it's empty before you put a dog in there if you're taking both types of dogs. So you really have to have some process in place to prevent that. Making sure you have those identification tools, whether it's something on the dog's collar, it's something on the dog's crate, it's something in the room, whatever. And then enclosure designs that can help prevent problems are gonna be things to reduce visual barriers. So making sure that if you have dogs that might wanna potentially hurt each other next to each other, that they can't see each other, visual, cues are really important to dogs. So trying to prevent some of that, even with daycares that have play yards next to each other and you can sometimes get fence fighting, trying to reduce that visual barrier can help. And then dogs keep making sure you have enclosures that keep tails and paws inside. So we've seen situations where a dog will slide its paw into the enclosure next to him and then get bitten or a tail, same thing. So making sure you've got tools like that to prevent problems, not just with fights that might happen in your yard, but also fights or situations that might happen in your lodging area as well. So policies and procedures, we've talked a lot. Training, training, training is probably the biggest thing. Making sure you've got training in place for your staff to supervise the dogs. And again, physically being present with the dogs is critical. We do not, we do not recommend just watching on a camera or just watching through a window. You have to be physically in the room with the dogs. And then they, the staff needs to understand those early signs of aggression and stress. So the signs that happen well before growling or snapping or barking or any of that. Using techniques that will help to manage the dogs and the techniques we use are primarily body blocking, splitting and redirecting. So Susan and I are huge advocates of positive training and more hands-off training. So all of our methods are really based on working with the dogs in a way that's not gonna scare them or cause any kind of stress in the dog. So those are the three primary ways we work with dogs in terms of managing them and moving them around. And then looking at what is your policy on mixing dogs of different sizes and managing that p potential for predatory drifts. So I know some facilities just are willing to take the risk, but I would really say as much as possible, mix those do don't mix dogs of different sizes in the off-leash play group, because you are, every time you do, you are taking a risk. And we do always get the question of, well, what about the Jack Russell who's just overwhelming to the little dogs or, you know, some schnauzer or whatever, some kind of, there's always that exception. And all that Susan and I would say is, just recognize that if you're taking that dog and you're saying, okay, well, the Jack Russell really is overwhelming to all the small dogs, so let's put him with the bigger dogs, just recognize you are taking a risk there and you really have to be aware of that. Um, making sure you have an acceptance policy. Like I said, most of the problems could be resolved if we just brought the right dogs in to daycare. And we really look at 
if you've looked at any of our material, we kind of classify dogs as red, yellow, and green. And red being those dogs probably shouldn't be in daycare at all. Green are like the easy dogs. In a perfect world, you would have tons and tons of green dogs. They're those easy dogs that are just low key, ready to play with everybody. But then you have these yellow dogs and yellow dogs are a little bit harder to manage. They're the ones your staff are probably spending most of their time with because they just, if they get amped up too much, they become a problem. Well, we would look at doing an 80-20 rule. So in any group, you don't want more than 20% yellow dogs. And that's a pretty easy thing for your staff to do every morning is just quickly go red, red, yellow, yellow, green, green. If you've got red, then I would automatically say you have a problem. So if your staff is saying these dogs are red, then maybe those dogs need a totally different um plan in terms of what they're doing because I wouldn't have those dogs in daycare and then look at the rest what are the yellow and green look like and if you have more than 20 percent yellow your play group is going to be more high risk of some kind of injury so that's just a really simple way of managing all of the potential for fights in your daycare and then again roll calls roll calls roll calls you will get some dogs that get overwhelmed in the play group and they end up hiding and you don't know they're there and then it's a potential that they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. So make sure, again, you're doing those hourly roll calls to prevent any kind of problem. Um, Robin, really quickly, uh, this is such great information. We did have um, someone that wants clarification on the slide um, for visual barriers with aggressive dogs. You encourage visual barriers with aggressive dogs. Is that yeah. Um, yeah. what you recommend? Yeah, anytime, at, visual cues for a dog are really important are really important. So they will key off of, they key off a whole bunch of things, smell and you know, what that dog's doing, whether it's barking or whatever. But if they can usually for a dog that is aggressive, if they see the other dog, it's going to amp them up even more. So by not allowing them to see them, you can sometimes help to kind of bring them down a little bit. So if, if there's a way to put you know, a board in between, like if you have two dogs, well, if you have two dogs really next to each other that hate each other, I would probably move them farther away. But if you just can't do that, then other measures are to put a barrier, you know, in front, or we used to have crates that we put dogs in for nap time. And we had some dogs that just couldn't handle a dog walking by their crate. So we would put a towel, we just hang a towel in front of the crate to block the visual uh, cue that another dog is walking by. It's not like they don't know the dog is there. They still can see it and I mean they can still hear it and smell it but not being able to see it does help. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. All right, um, and so in the time we've got left we just want to share some other safety concerns. Again, our whole mission with this um, session today is to help you avoid tragedy. So we're just going to share some other things to put on your radar and, and your procedures um, to make sure that they don't happen to you. So the first one we're gonna talk about are collars. And for off-leash play, this has been a debate ever since Robin and I um, started joining the industry back in the late 90s, 2000. Should dogs play with collars on or off? And we promote for safety that dogs play naked or without collars, because again, we've seen too many instances where What'll happen, dogs play with their mouths and they're playing around the neck area, which is where they like to play and, and a lot of the wrestling style, styles. And what will happen is when the lower jaw may get caught in the collar. Well, then the dog whose collar they stuck in begins to have a hard time breathing. So then he may twist and now they can't get separated. And it can inevitably be really hard to get over and get them separated. Um, unfortunately, we know of many deaths that happen this way in off-leash play. So that's why we promote not letting collars on dogs when they play together. Now, again, people say, well, the risk of escape. So for my center, we were all indoors and we had multiple doors um, between our play areas and outside. So the risk was low. I now realized that was easier to make the decision to play naked. So if you're really concerned about escape and having an identification on the dogs, then you need to have policies set up to where you definitely don't allow leather or chains or any type of collar or dangling tags that are hard to um, cut off or impossible to cut off. And if you are going to allow 
collars, then you need to have um, like seat belt, harness, um, shears, medical shears, and they need to be very close in every play area to where if a dog gets caught in a collar, you can get to them really quickly. Um, there are some Velcro breakaway collars that people have used in the industry, but again, if dogs are going to be in collars, you've got to say, okay, what are we going to do in the instance um, they get stuck together? Tags can be dangerous even with dogs in lodging. We took collars off of our lodging dogs as well, because if they jump up, that tag can catch um, in the fencing and they can potentially hang themselves. And I've known of dogs that's happened not only in professional pet care, but even at home on like puppy bar fencing and stuff. So collars can definitely um, be dangerous. And so you need to have safety protocols to um, reduce the risk of anything happened with a dog wearing their collar while they're in your care. Um, the next thing we wanna talk about are toxins. And again, this seems obvious that dogs shouldn't get into anything that's going to be toxic, but it can happen. So you need to make sure that you're following um, OSHA standards, that you know the proper dilution, staff's trained to dilute properly, and that all storage is done far away from any animal area. Um, you don't, if you have mop buckets and there's, and they're in the play areas, you wanna make sure dogs can't accidentally get around and, and drink the water. Um, so again, using, Safe chemicals is a way to start, but if you are using things, then making sure that you're storing it properly, mixing it properly, and then protecting it to where pets can't accidentally get to it. So you want to make sure that there is no way that a dog could get off leash and then get into something they shouldn't. So be aware of that. And also um, electrical cords. Um, dogs can chew on electrical cords and get electrocuted. So I one time saw you know, somebody trying to cool things off, but they ran an extension cord through a dog area, and that's a no-no. Um, you have to keep it up and away. And then water, we're going back to water. Pools and all that can be great fun, but we also need to keep in mind that dogs can drown. Um, we've, again, heard of small dogs drowning, bigger dogs drowning, um, and it can happen in even the little kitty pools. So we need to, again, be doing those roll calls, um, knowing how many dogs are in the pool area and watching them. Using life vest if you're not sure about if dogs can swim. Some of the dogs that are very compact, like um, bulldogs, anytime they were in our pool, they had to have a life um, jacket on because they just have a tendency to sink. You can also have um, excessive water intake, which can cause cells to swell and brain damage. So, you know, it, people think it may be funny, dogs, you know, snapping water at water and drinking hose water, and this is really cute, but you have to be careful that they're not getting water toxicity. And so again, doing your roll calls every 10 to 15 minutes to ensure that you don't see any signs of lethargy, definitely monitor for vomiting or bloating, loss of coordination, restlessness, um, just being aware of water toxicity and the symptoms and monitoring for that. So dogs that are at higher risk or smaller dogs or dogs with little body fat, really high energy dogs that are kind of OCD to do um, snap at water or inhale a lot of water. Um, so watch for that. Keep your pools play fun. As Robin said, if you have kitty pools and they're empty, what I've seen people do is take like a carabiner clip and they have a hole in the pool and it's clipped to the fence so that there's no way it can accidentally fall on a dog. Um, it's just all about extra safety um, measures. And then we also wanna talk about toys. Toys can be a lot of fun, but we need to make sure that toys are always kept in really good condition and are safe for the dogs. They need to be the proper size for the dogs. So if you've got toys for smaller dogs versus bigger dogs, you know, make sure that a large dog can't accidentally, you know, get a hold of a ball that could get stuck in their throat. Um, things that are durable, hard rubber that don't have little pieces coming off are important. Tennis balls, make sure once they've popped them and can start getting the little rubber pieces, they need to be thrown away. And sometimes what I found in my center was I needed to give permission to my team to throw things away that were dangerous and pull them. 
Um, sometimes they hear us talk about money and not wasting things, so they can have a tendency to not throw things away. But you need to have a policy about safety over um, cost of things. So regularly inspect your toys and also regularly clean and disinfect them. That's going to be really important right now with COVID that you have protocols in place that toys are cleaned regularly. So we talked a little bit about this in the beginning is all the reasons that you might be here. Maybe you're a manager or owner looking to just enhance all of your policies and procedures, which is awesome to avoid all these problems. Wouldn't you love to have less stress? And this is all of our, this is all everyone's vision for being a business owner. They just want to be on the beach, hanging out with not a care in the world. And that's what we want to help you with now. So in the next few minutes that we have left, we want to just really help you understand what you can do now especially during this time when maybe you can take a little bit more time to review everything that you're doing with your team to make sure that your policies, when you come back uh, opened again full time, all of your policies are in place to prevent these injuries. So number one, really going back to that staff training, really looking at the process you're using and going through that, that formal process or whatever you're using now and just go through this checklist are you teaching about dog language, the stress signals and the warning signals? Or do you have a way to teach about first aid, whether that's you're doing it or maybe you do an in-service with a local veterinarian or maybe you have somebody that's certified as a first aid instructor, but do you have that? And is it being done routinely as continuing education? And all of this stuff I would say should have continuing education in it as well, not just train them once and then you forget about it. Do you have those chemical safety sheets in your facility and you understand the cleaning processes and you're going through an actual step-by-step -step process for how to mix chemicals and what chemicals to use. Are you setting up a process where you're using those roll call procedures, which we talked about? What's your customer service process, even to talk to clients about the things that they need to do to help you or the things that are in place that they need to understand. So going through that, whatever you're doing right now for training your staff, just go rework it and rethink it and add things to it and just make sure you're touching on everything that's important to prevent these tragedies. Creating, oh, I'm gonna- And then, you, you know, make sure, <laughs> yeah, just make sure your environment's safe. We've talked a lot about fencing um, for summer. Make sure you've got those temperature controls, good working thermometers. You also know the humidity and someone's in charge each day for setting the guidelines. And then that everybody is aware of the safe, safe location for toxins and how to ensure that dogs don't get into anything that they shouldn't. And then you wanna create and enforce your policies on, you know, separating dogs by size, um, whether they wear collars or not, how long certain dogs can be outside and weather extremes. And this can also apply in really cold weather um, as well too. Again, we we hopefully you all go away and do roll calls of nothing else after this because it is a way to prevent things from dogs having a problem and you not recognizing it quickly. Um, formalizing that dog acceptance and evaluation process based on behaviors you want to see and are acceptable. And then again, checking your rooms, checking your outside areas before you let dogs out for safety. This could even be to make sure nothing was thrown into the yard overnight. I would have my team go out and do a perimeter check before dogs were let into any of the outdoor areas over, um, first thing because you just never know what may have happened overnight. And then um, we also want to make sure that we focus on, you know, safety is in those details, that formal training of technical knowledge on the job procedures and following it. It's holding them accountable to what is supposed to be happening. Um, and a great trainer is going to explain, demonstrate, and then observe to make sure people are following those SOPs. And so we need to make sure we're doing a good job of training our team, that the procedures are documented and that everybody knows what their roles and responsibility is and then holding them accountable. And I think the important thing we sometimes forget is to explain why, to connect the dots. I think once people really understand why it's so important to do the roll call, then um, you'll have better compliance. And then, you know, your design and systems matter, having those double doors and gates. Um, professional grade materials that are more sturdy, enclosures that go all the way to the floor so tails and paws can't go between them. Same thing with your dividers. 
and then a maintenance and repair process for people to report when things um, may not be um, safe anymore so that it can get fixed. And I think a big tip is to have regular team and staff meetings. I would share some of the things you learned here today just so that they are aware and can help you ensure a tragedy doesn't happen in your center. So we wanna help you with some of this and hopefully you've taken some notes on that handout and maybe came up with a few ideas that are new to you that you just wanna reinforce. And again, continuing education, maybe just having your staff listen to this whole presentation just to make sure that they're aware that you're reminding them that that problems really can happen. But we do wanna help you. So we're gonna, we, uh, Susan and I put together a document called the four E's of excellence a couple years ago. And it really is the industry standards for dog daycare. And we also have a roll to call handout, which is a nine point safety check. And that's, if you heard us throughout this saying that that was so important. If you just, like Susan said, if you do nothing from this webinar, if you just start doing roll calls, that's gonna increase your chance of not having a tragedy. So we wanna give those to you free. Those are actually actually something we sell, but we are gonna give them to everybody free on this webinar. So look for an email probably tomorrow, um, I think. It'll be you know within the next 24 to 48 hours, we'll send an email. Jess is gonna send us the um, emails of everybody, so we'll get that out to you. So look for that email in your inbox and that'll have those two documents in it and hopefully that will help you to prevent tragedies in the future and i think i'm going to hand it back over to jess i don't know if we have any questions or if you have to contact either me or susan our contact information is there as well but we just really appreciate you all being here and listening to us for an hour and taking an hour of your time and we really do feel like this is just great timing because so many of you now are working on your staff training and your protocols and your policies so take this time to really dive into those while you have a chance to do it without as much craziness. Well, there's craziness, but a different type of craziness. There's not all those dogs in your facility right now. So now you can really focus on trying to really get these things written and documented and understand how to use them. But do we have any questions, Jess? I'll just go. Yeah, we've got some. We've got some great questions here. Uh, so everybody, stay tuned. Uh, one thing I do want to provide uh, in the event people have to leave is the CEU code for our PAC certified providers that were able to attend today. The CEU code is in the chat box, um, but it, I'll uh, say it here. It is C as in cat, C as in cat, one seven zero. 160 CC170160 and it's also in the chat box. Um, Robin and Susan, if you have a few minutes for a couple great questions, we would appreciate a little bit more time. Um, uh, first question uh, related to heat that came in a couple of times. Is there a specific chart for dangerous temperatures that you would recommend? Doing a we, that one. Yeah, we actually do have a chart. Um, and I don't know, Robin, if we can include that in what we send out. That was created by one of our members early on. Um, it's a heat and, heat and humidity chart. So. Um, okay, I, yeah, I also, I'm writing myself a note to, I'll send that out as well. Yeah. All right. Great. That's appreciated. It's a good one. Um, second question when we get into the section on fights and bites. Um, how do you determine if a dog is green, yellow, or red? And a follow-up to that is, what do you do if one employee thinks the dog is green and another employee thinks the dog is, is yellow or has that conflict there? That's a, that's a great question, actually. Um, we actually, in the book off Leash Dog Play, we actually map all of the behaviors out and classify them that way. But here's what I will tell you that the easiest way is just to sit down with your staff because you really can do this pretty intuitively. If you just sit down with your staff and you say, look, we're going to classify the dogs green, yellow, red. So here's the basic parameters. Green are like those dogs we never worry about. They're just like so easy. We love them, whatever. They never, we never feel like we're overly managing them. We're never trying to pull them off of a dog or they're just the dogs we love to have because they're so easy. Red, hopefully, again, you don't have any of those dogs. Red are the dogs that are like constantly dangerous and in, in, at high risk of getting into some kind of a fight. And then yellow is going to be everything else. So yellow are the dogs that 
you're going to tell your staff yellow are the ones that you're constantly having to you know take them off a dog because they're mounting or they're constantly barking for attention or they just annoy the other dog so those are the other terms to use or they just seem grumpy sometimes those are usually yellow dogs and so you i usually just tell my staff look let's just sit down and just label every dog so if you have a conflict where one employee thinks they're green and one employee thinks they're yellow i would err to the higher side and i would just because you have to go to the common denominator so i would go up one if if somebody says you know they're green and they're yellow it that might be a difference in just the experience and level of experience of the staff member it's also possible that staff get a little bit we all get a little bit blinded by our love for certain dogs so sometimes it's just hard to admit that the dog you just absolutely love is really a pain in the butt so <laughs> sometimes it's that too but if there's a disagreement i would err on the higher color if that makes sense very good um and this is related to that a little bit i think it's important to um answer this question but a question came in what do you do if you have a dog that snaps at another every time another dog gets close to them yeah some dogs have space um parameters that are larger than what we think maybe is reasonable but that's what it is for that dog and we need to honor that and respect that and so if a dog is snapping when other dogs get near them if they're in group play i would probably pull them out because it's probably not an activity that they're enjoying I don't think we should be putting dogs in position to basically defend themselves and give warnings all day. That's just not fair. I mean, just think about how would you feel because that's stressful if they're constantly having to snap. So we really say that we should have other activities for dogs that don't enjoy group play but are still very engaging. So you can do, you know, a doggy day out with um, individual play, individual enrichment, um, mental engagement, nose work, it, we would recommend finding a different activity um, for that dog. Okay, um, another great question. For larger pet care uh, centers that have uh, larger numbers of dogs and your recommendation of no collars, uh, what would you do? Some of the staff have a hard time telling the black labs apart or the golden retrievers apart, which they might have four or five of them at any given day. What do you recommend in that situation? So we would uh, we would typically recommend using some kind of paper collar to identify those. So some of the POS systems can actually print those out. So it's less risky. Those paper collars are gonna be easier to break and get off. And if a dog really does get tangled in those, usually they'll break themselves. If you have to cut them, they're a whole lot easier to cut. But if you really need some kind of a identification with a dog's name on it to help the staff not send the wrong dog home to the wrong pet parent, then we would look at that type of an option. Okay, fantastic. Um, um, we didn't get to all the questions, but I think we got to the ones that came in multiple times. Uh, we've had many, many um, thanks, and this information is great. So we really appreciate you uh, being online today. Um, a number of people have said if, if your daycare or your pet care center does not have off-leash dog play, that uh, that book is a necessary read. Um, so we appreciate that. Um, Robin and Susan, we appreciate having you here today. Your knowledge is always so is always uh, so helpful. Um, again, that PAC CEU code is CC170160. Uh, Robin and Susan, any other uh, comments before we sign off here today? Oh, final thing, a recording will be available very soon. We will send that out to everybody that registered. Uh, you can share it with your staff or you can rewatch it if you'd like to as well. Uh, Robin and Susan, any other final words before we sign off today? No, just if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Okay, right. and if you want more, uh, Susan, anything from you? I just want to thank everybody for being here and thank you, Pat, for um, hosting us. We um, really encourage you to consider PAC certification. It, it makes a difference. You took the words right out of my mouth, Susan. Thank you so much. 
Um, all right, we appreciate everyone. If you need more information on PAC, you can visit our website. You can uh, Google us or the website is P-A-C-C-E-R-T, P-A-C-C-E-R-T dot com, dot org, um, PAC.org. Um, all right, sounds good. Thank you everyone and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your day.